Good afternoon. Delma and I are here today recording the lesson for uh, lesson number 12, the adult Sunday school uh, lesson uh, number 12 for Sunday, February the 21st, 2021. Can you imagine that? We're that far, almost two months into the year already. Let me make a couple of announcements and then we'll get into uh, the, the content. Uh, just remember that we still have that petition that you can sign to stop the right to abortion amendment in Virginia to the Constitution of Virginia. You may sign the petition online at vshl.org. And uh, also, DCA, Denver Christian Academy, has Auto Bell and Cruise Through Car Wash gift certificates, uh, gift cards available for purchase uh, before and after the services, and also in the school offices. We still have Need Prayer door hangers available. If you'd like to distribute some of those in your neighborhood, please grab some of those and do that. Remember that uh, if you missed a weekly bulletin, all you got to do is take your phone and scan the QR code uh, when you're in the building, and uh, you, you, you'll find those codes throughout the posted in the uh, hallways and uh, bathrooms. You can pull up your bu weekly bulletin. Uh, next Saturday, uh, February the 27th, uh, we will have our next membership class. So if you're interested in knowing a little more about WOW or wanting to join the church, we ask that you come to this class. It will be in this fellowship hall from 9 to 3. Uh, we have a limit capacity of 24 people. We have nursery available for the first five children up to age 12. A lunch will be provided, and uh, we ask that you please sign up in the lobby and or online. CareNet is looking to hire a full-time client advocate, so if you want more information, please go to cnpeninsula.org. And then our last announcement for today is that on March the 13th, the, we are beginning a new discipleship class uh, called the Conquer Series for our men. You remember we had authentic manhood uh, for the last uh, couple of years or longer, and so we finished that. And now we're, we're going to begin the Conquer Series for Men, uh, March the 13th. It'll be once a month on Saturday mornings on Zoom platform. If you say, well, I don't know how to Zoom, uh, we can give you all the instructions. Matter of fact, email has already been sent out to most of you men that participated in the Authentic Men who'd give you instructions on how to do that. So look for that email. The books are $17 a piece. And... Uh, uh, you can either register uh, in person uh, um, on Sundays or you can register online also now for that. All right. Those are the announcements. And uh, let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on the lesson today. Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace, your mercy and kindness to us. Thank you for your love, your unfailing love, Father Lord, that the depths we've never even begin to, to understand uh, and to explore. Thank you so much, Father Lord, for uh, the message of Jesus Christ, for the life, death, resurrection, ascension of Christ. And we're going to look at that today in this lesson. I pray, Father Lord, as we are wrapping up this quarter of lessons from the Gospel of Mark, today and next Sunday, we'll look at uh, Jesus' trial, His betrayal, His trial, His death, and His resurrection. Father, Lord, give us insight into your word and into these lessons. Help us to see principles from your word, Father, Lord, that we need for our lives. And we pray, God, that you would illuminate our hearts with your word and by your Holy Spirit. Meet the needs of our people, Father, Lord, those in the hospitals, those on our prayer list. We pray, God, that you would supply, Father, Lord, healing power to them. And we give you praise and glory and honor in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right. If you have your Bibles, please turn to uh, Mark chapter 14. Last week's lesson was in chapter 13. Today, we're looking in chapter uh, 14, the latter part of 14, beginning at verse 43, uh, where Jesus is betrayed and arrested, and we'll actually go down through the first, teen, fifth, the first 15 verses of chapter 15. So quite a bit of scripture in the, in the lesson today. This lesson is specifically about the betrayal of Jesus, his trial uh, by the Jews and by the Roman governor. So we're going to look at those three elements of the lesson today. While Jesus had always known that the suffering and death was awaiting him, um, Judas's act of betrayal 
uh, must have proven to be very disappointing. However hurtful it must have been, that betrayal by Judas, um, it kind of set in motion what would be the most significant event that would uh, ever take place with respect to the redemption of mankind. And that is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, while we focus oftentimes on Jesus' sufferings in terms of his crucifixion, we will see in this lesson specifically his suffering was much more than just his crucifixion. He suffered much, uh, and he did that more, not just the physical, he suffered emotional uh, uh, suffering as well and the betrayal at the hands of Judas. And so we're going to see that uh, he did all of this so that we might have eternal life and salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at this story and under the law of Moses, we're talking about Jesus' standing trial and that we know that they want to condemn him to death. We know under the law of Moses that the death penalty was available for punishment for 18 different crimes. However, in the actual history of the Israelites and their descendants, the Jews, the death penalty was very rarely imposed because the law of Moses required something unique. It required that you have two or more eyewitnesses to the specific crime. So while the Jewish court that tried Jesus had no authority under Roman law to impose the death penalty for any crime. So when we see that the, the Jewish court, Jesus is betrayed, he's sent for trial before uh, the high priest and before Pilate, but before the high priest, the Jewish court had no authority under Roman law to impose a death penalty. Now, the uh, Jewish religious leaders in Jesus' time would sometimes have people murdered by uh, uh, thugs and, and, and those Jewish mobs that they believed were worthy of death. Uh, and sometimes the mobs would stone people to death. The Roman government had a tendency to look the other way when that happened. When those kinds of offenses happened, they just kind of looked the other way. Today in uh, chapter 14, and let's begin at verse 43, let's read down through uh, 45. And immediately, even as Jesus said this, Judas one of the twelve disciples arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priest, the teachers of the religious law, and the elders. The traitor, Judas, had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. Then you can take him away under guard. As soon as they had arrived, Judas walked up to Jesus. Rabbi, he exclaimed, and gave him the kiss. Here we see what must have been most trying. Jesus knew his suffering was coming. He knew he came to die. And yet one of his own 12 disciples, apostles, betrays him. This lesson today in chapter 1443 begins at the point uh, where Jesus and the disciples are in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night before he's crucified the next morning. Now, we know that Jesus is then betrayed by Judas. Now, this did not come as a surprise to, Judah, uh, to Jesus because he had always known, and he says it in John chapter 6. I want us to go there, John chapter 6, and look at verse 70. Notice what Jesus says. Then Jesus said, I have chosen the twelve of you, but one is a devil. He was speaking of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, one of the twelve, whom would later betray him. So Jesus had always known, he, he, it didn't catch him by surprise that Judas betrayed him. He had known that. All right? However, at the Last Supper, after Jesus had washed the uh, disciples' feet uh, there, including Judas, Judas's feet as well. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, 
that one of you shall betray me. And when he has dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. A short time later, that very same night, then Judas approached Jesus uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane and betrayed him with the kiss, a prearranged signal as a kiss. And notice that in Jesus' day, a kiss was a sign of friendship. It's interesting that Judas uses the kiss, a sign of friendship, as the sign identifying Jesus as the uh, Christ, the one to be arrested. The irony of Judas's action can be heard in Jesus's reply to him, as we see in Luke chapter 22, verse 48. It says, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? In other words, how could you betray me with a kiss? A sign of friendship. So what are, are we to think about Judas as being one of the twelve? I, I know I've had thoughts throughout my uh, Christian life about Judas. How could Jesus uh, choose a betrayer uh, to be one of his own? Uh, I've thought a lot about that. The Apostle Peter said this of Judas in uh, Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 17, and also references in 20. And you can also look in Psalm 69 and 109. It says, but he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now, this is Peter talking about Judas. He was numbered with us and he obtained part of this ministry. Now, it would appear from these words of Peter that that Peter regarded Jesus, Judas as one of the 12 disciples until he made that decision to betray Jesus. When Judas put into action the evil that had been kind of festering in his mind and festering in his heart to betray Jesus, we see that Satan entered into him and his doom was sealed. Now, if you want to read a little more about this, you can see uh, what had been going on in the mind of Judas in Matthew 26, 14 through 16. John chapter 13, verse 27, actually gives us that where Satan entered into Judas, when, say, when Judas opened the door. And then in Matthew chapter 26, verse 24, it, we see that, that his fate is sealed. Now, in verse 46, down through 52, Let's read that together. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. So Jesus had been betrayed by Judas with a kiss. Then the others, those other men that came with swords and clubs that were sent by the religious leaders and the elders, they grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. I keep reading. Jesus asked them, Am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there among you teaching every day. But these things are happening to fulfill what the scriptures say about me. Then all of his disciples deserted him. All of his disciples deserted him and ran away. One young man following behind was clothed only in a long linen shirt. When the mob tried to grab him, he slipped out of his shirt and ran away naked. Now I'm going to give you some information about that young man that ran away naked. Some interesting thoughts. But when we read this passage, we see that Jesus is arrested. But here's a question. Why did the enemies of Jesus seek to have Judas identify him for them? Why was it necessary? They, Jesus had been with them every day in the temple. They knew who Jesus was. They knew what he looked like. Why did they have Judas identify him for them? Well, I think it's kind of simple. They just wanted to make sure that the man they arrested was Jesus. I don't think we need to read any more into it. Matthew, Mark, Luke all tell that one of Jesus' apostles 
attempted to save Jesus from being arrested by cutting off the ear of the Jewish high priest's servant. Now, none say it was Peter. All right. So we were talking about the lesson uh, where Jesus is arrested, and we're talking about uh, Mark chapter 14, verse 46 through 52. And we were asking the question, talking about how that Jesus uh, was being identified and how, why did the enemies of Jesus seek to have Judas identify Jesus with, uh, for them and with a kiss. And basically, it's uh, because they wanted to make sure. It's nighttime. It's dark. They're coming into the garden at nighttime. They, Jesus has been there a while with his disciples. It's dark. Uh, they've got torches, they've got clubs, they've got spears, and they want to make sure they're arresting the right man. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell that one of the uh, Jesus' apostles attempted to save him from being arrested by cutting off the ear of the, of the Jewish high priest's servant. Now, Matthew, Mark, or Luke don't say uh, that it was Peter, but John the apostle, who was a very close associate and friend of Peter, says in his gospel that Peter was the one who did this. If you go to John chapter 18 and verse 20, and we'll look at that, John 18, 20, where John specifically says it was Peter that cut off the servant's ear. So it says, uh, John uh, chapter 18, verse 10. Then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. Let's read verse 11. But Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? And so Jesus is identified, I mean, Jesus uh, says to Peter, Put it away. I came for this purpose. I came to suffer. I came to die. I came to fulfill the will of my Father. But John is the one who identifies the Apostle Peter. Now, we, we know that that's kind of characteristic for Peter somewhat because he is the oldest of the apostles. He is uh, likely the first disciple chosen by Jesus. And so based on those seniorities, he kind of took a position of authority among the 12. And no doubt he's trying to save Jesus, but Jesus has put it back. He put it back. Now, now notice that, that not only did Jesus intervene and stop Peter's action, but he also healed the man whose ear he'd cut off. He, he healed the man's ear, picked up and put the ear back on, heal the man, all right? And we see this in Luke chapter 22, verse 51. So Jesus then spoke to those who had come to arrest him and inquired, inquired of them why they came to arrest him as if he were a common criminal when he said, I was with you every day in the temple. You could have arrested me there. Why didn't you take me there? But Jesus knew why. And he says it in the last phrase. He said, but however... Scripture must be fulfilled. And so Jesus had conducted his public ministry. He wasn't private in his ministry. He had a public ministry. And he went all over Galilee and the public synagogues. And even in Jerusalem, he was in the temple every day. And so he, he conducted his ministry in Jerusalem in plain sight of, in view of the people, in view of the religious leaders. And they had not arrested him. But now it's time for the scriptures to uh, uh, be fulfilled that had foretold of Jesus' death. Now, a uh, Peter says in Acts chapter 2, if you flip over to Acts 2 and look at verse 23. Now, this is the Apostle Peter. He's preaching on the day of Pentecost. They've just been filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there's a question about what's going on. And he says this in verse 23. But God knew what would happen, and His prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed Him to a cross and killed Him. So very boldly, we see under the anointing and unction of the Holy Spirit, Peter says in his sermon that day that Jesus uh, had been delivered by the predetermined counsel of God. Okay. So as Jesus was taken into police or uh, uh, custody of his enemies, all his apostles forsook him and fled, verse 50 says in Mark 13. So when we look at that, we see that earlier that same evening, 
all of them had given their very solemn word, an oath to Jesus that they would die with him, that they would never deny him. You see this in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 35. And it says, No, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. We all always want to blame Peter, but all the disciples took the same vow. They all vowed the same, that they would die for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, notice that <clears throat> they've taken this, and it appears that Peter may have try, tried to make good on his promise that he would die uh, with Jesus when he cut off the ear of the servant, because more than likely, what he was really trying to do was probably split the man's skull wide open with his sword, and he missed and sliced off his ear instead. Now, think about that for a moment. If he'd done that, he likely would have also then been arrested and charged with a crime. But Jesus stopped Peter, and a short while later, we know that Peter uh, denied knowing Jesus three times. It is generally believed that, that, remember that last verse I read, it said that young man that was in a linen shirt, and they tried to grab him, the crowd, the mob tried to grab him, and he wiggled out of his shirt and ran away naked. Many scholars believe that the young man who ran away when Jesus was arrested was John Mark, the very man who wrote this book, the author of the Gospel of Mark. Now, in uh, this account of Jesus' arrest, uh, if, it's, if this account shows us anything, it, it's one thing uh, should be that it's by our own strength and our determination alone, we cannot save ourselves. We can't do anything. We can't, we can't depend on ourselves to be faithful to Jesus Christ when our loyalty to Him is severely tested. All 12 disciples, well, excuse me, 11 disciples had said they would die for Jesus and all fled. So when they were severely tested, they all fled, right? So we, we know from this point then that our own strength and our determination alone cannot help us to be totally and completely faithful to Jesus. It should be very humbling to us that all of the 12 failed Jesus in some major way, all 12. If it is our sincere desire to never betray, to never forsake or deny the Lord Jesus, then we have to learn what the disciples have to learn. And that is we have to learn to depend on the grace of our Lord. We need to depend on the power of His Word and we need to depend on the power of the Holy Spirit to keep us faithful to the Lord Jesus. So I want, I want to repeat that. If we want to be faithful to Jesus and we do not want to betray Him, then we must learn to depend on His grace, on the power of His Word, and in the power of His Holy Spirit to keep us faithful to Him. We have no right to boast in our own faithfulness to Christ because the only reason that we do remain faithful to Jesus is because of His faithfulness to us. Look at verse 53. It says, um, They took Jesus to the high priest's home where the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of the religious law had gathered. Meanwhile, Peter followed him at a distance and went right into the high priest's courtyard. There he sat with the guards, warming himself by the fire. Inside, the leading priest and the entire high council were trying to find evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they couldn't find any. Many false witnesses spoke against him, but they contradicted each other. Remember I told you, Jewish law, the law of Moses said that you must have two or more eyewitnesses. Well, the witnesses that these high council trying to find against Christ contradicted each other, so you couldn't get more than one. Okay. All right. Finally, some men stood up and gave false testimony. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another made without human hands. But even then, they didn't get their story straight. Then the high priest stood, be 
stood up before the others and asked Jesus, Well, aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus was silent and made no reply. Then the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Now notice what Jesus answers. In verse 62, Jesus replied, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of honor at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes to show his horror and said, Why do we need other witnesses? You have all heard this, his blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they all cried. He deserves to die. Then some of them began to spit at him, and they blindfolded him and beat him with their fists. Prophesy to us, they jeered, and the guards slapped him as they took him away. On the night that Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane, he was taken to the house of the high priest of the Jews to be tried before the Sanhedrin council. The Sanhedrin council was made up of 70 members plus the high priest who presided over them. The chief priests and the council had sought for witnesses against Jesus to find some cause so that they could condemn him to death. But the witnesses failed to provide the cause because they contradicted, they could not agree. This became apparent and it basically meant that the disciple, I mean, the witnesses were lying. It was obvious that they were making it up because their accusations against Jesus did not agree. Now, desiring to maintain at least the appearance of being just, the council decided not to base their condemnation of Jesus on blatantly false testimony. So unwilling to condemn Jesus to death on the basis of false testimony, the high priest then decided to question Jesus himself. Now notice, first he asked Jesus to refute the testimony that was given against him, but Jesus refuses to answer, signifying that the testimony was not worthy of an answer. They were lying against Jesus. Why would Jesus want to speak against it? It wasn't even worthy of comment. The high priest, annoyed by Jesus' silence, asked him very plainly, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed? To this, what did Jesus say? I am. I am. He identified himself as the Messiah. He identified himself as the Son of God. That's what it meant by the Son of the Blessed. Okay. Then, referring to a messianic prophecy in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, Jesus is referencing Prophecies from Daniel, no doubt, the religious leaders he's talking to knew the reference. Okay? Jesus said that those who were trying, were trying him would see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, the right hand of God, and coming in the clouds of heaven. This is in Daniel chapter 7. It's also mentioned in verse, chapter, uh, uh, verse 62 of this chapter and also in Revelation chapter 1-7. The high priest obtained from Jesus what he could not obtain from false witnesses. Jesus spoke the truth about himself, and the high priest regarded this as sufficient evidence to condemn Jesus to death. In a very dramatic display of anger toward Jesus, the high priest tears his clothes and accuses Jesus of blasphemy. Obviously, they do not recognize that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is Mary and Joseph's boy, and He is uh, a false prophet. The high priest called out to the council, Well, what do you think, based on what you've heard? And their reply was that they all condemned Him to be guilty of death. So unleashing their hatred toward Jesus, members of the council and their servants began spitting on Jesus and assaulted him. Now, what I find interesting is that they blindfold him and then they assault him as if they didn't want him to see who was hitting him. In Mark 14, verse 66, meanwhile, now notice we began to say earlier in the verses that Peter followed the, uh, Jesus into the courtyard. Meanwhile, Peter was in the courtyard below. One of the servant girls who worked for the high priest came by and noticed Peter warming himself at the fire. She looked at him closely and said, You're one of those with Jesus of Nazareth. 
But Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about, he said, and he went out into the entryway. Just then, a rooster crowed. When the servant girl saw him standing there, she began telling the others, this man is definitely one of them, but Peter denied it again. A little later, some of the other bystanders confronted Peter and said, You must be one of them because you are Galilean. Peter swore a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know this man you're talking about. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times that you even know me. And he broke down and he wept. Here we see G Peter denying the Lord Jesus. At this point, we see that Mark shifts the story from where Jesus leaves. He's being tried before the high priest. He's been condemned to death and he's getting ready to be taken out as they take him away. Then Mark shifts the scene back over to Peter in the courtyard. And, and he, he moves it from Jesus and the Sanhedrin back to Peter. And, and we know that Jesus, Peter followed Jesus as he was taken into the garden of the high priest. So as Jesus is being questioned, Peter's waiting outside in the courtyard and he's warming himself. Because remember, this happens overnight. Jesus was arrested late at night in the garden. He's up all night long. He's tried by the Sanhedrin. Then in the very wee hours of the morning, he's sent over to Pilate. And notice now that, that Peter is there outside warming himself. So Jesus is inside where uh, he's questioned by the high priest. He acknowledges his true identity as the Son of God. While Peter's in the courtyard and he's confronted by a little servant girl. Now, Jesus is standing before the entire council and the high priest, and he identifies who he is, truthfully. Peter's in the courtyard, and he's confronted by a servant girl, and he denies that he ever knew Jesus. He denies him two times, another two times, and he is affirming his denial to be true when he curses the third time and brings, says, brings a curse down on himself if he's not telling the truth. He's swearing to the veracity of his words, okay? So this only compounds to the extent of the denial, uh, and really it only extends to the extent that Peter's lying. He's, he's not telling the truth either. So after his third denial of Jesus, we see Peter hears the rooster crow, and he remembered exactly what Jesus had told him that would happen. And what was his response? Peter breaks down in bitter tears. When Jesus told Peter that he would deny him three times before the rooster uh, crowed twice, he also said to Peter in Luke 22, 32, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. Peter's denial of Jesus was a very serious moral failure, but it did not ruin his life because Jesus had prayed for him that his faith would not fail. Sadly, believers in Jesus Christ are sometimes guilty of serious moral failures. But this does not have to result in the loss of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means we can repent, we can be forgiven, we can be restored right back into a right relationship with Christ. Faith is lost simply, not simply because they some believers sometimes fail, right? But more importantly, because they make a decision to defect from faith, to turn from their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to remember that there is a great difference between a Christian who fails and repents and is restored to a right, a right relationship and the one who intentionally defects from faith in Christ and refuses to repent. Now, we're wrapping up the lesson here and let's read uh, 15 verses 1 through 15. Very early in the morning, remember I just said Jesus was sent in the wee hours of the morning. Very early in the morning, the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of religious law, the entire high council, that means 71 members, 
met to discuss their next step. They bound Jesus and led him away and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Remember, they could, they could condemn him, but they couldn't kill him. Okay. Right? Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, you have said it. Then the leading priests kept accusing him of many crimes. Right? There's where they're lying. Okay, many crimes. And Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer them? What about all these charges they're bringing against you? But Jesus said nothing, much to Pilate's surprise. Now, if it was the governor, it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner, anyone the people requested. One of the prisoners at the time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. The crowd went to Pilate and asked him to release a prisoner as usual. Would you like me to release to you this king of the Jews? Pilate asked, for he realized that by now the leading priest had arrested Jesus out of envy. They were jealous of Jesus. But at, that t at this point, the leading priest stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas against Jesus, instead of Jesus. Pilate asked him, then what should I do with this man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. So to pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. At this point, Jesus has been betrayed. He's been tried. He has, was accused. They tried to accuse him of multiple crimes for which they could get no witnesses to agree. They questioned Jesus directly. And the high priest asked him if he is the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus says, I am. And he stated the truth. They refused to accept the truth, condemned him to death, and now they are sending him before Pilate. So the religious leaders of the Jews had no authority. I've said that once, but they had no authority under Roman law to put anybody to death. Nevertheless, they were determined. You can see they were determined to kill Jesus. So uh, we see that uh, it likely, if you go back to chapter 26 of Matthew, it's likely that they had secretly intended to murder Jesus after the Passover. But an opportunity presented itself. Now, Passover spans eight days. So, originally, they had planned to murder Jesus secretly after Passover at the end of those eight days. But Judas's betrayal gives them an opportunity they did not expect, an unexpected opportunity. They decided to arrest Jesus, charge him with a crime worthy of death under the law of Moses, and then bring him to Pilate to obtain a Roman sentence of death against him. And this is exactly what they did. And it resulted in Je Jesus being crucified by the Romans. Even though Jesus offered no defense of himself to Pilate, the governor knew Jesus had done nothing deserving of the death penalty. All four of the Gospels make it plain to see that Pilate did not believe Jesus had done anything worthy of death. And Pilate actually labored to avoid condemning him to death. We see this in John chapter 19. In the end, though, Pilate gave in. He caved in to political pressure placed on him by the Jewish religious leaders and put in him, put in Pilate, fear that if he did not submit to their demand that Jesus be crucified, that he might even lose his own position as governor or even his life. Why? Because the Jews would rebel against Pilate. They would have a rebellion. The re Rome would see the rebellion and say, this leader is not effective and replace him. So if the Jews charge against Pilate of treason against the emperor were believed, that they put that fear in him. So unwillingly, Pilate condemns Jesus to be crucified, knowing that he's condemning an innocent man. We see this in Matthew 27, 24. But what did this do? This makes Pilate's guilt even more worse than it was, because he's condemned an innocent man that he tried to save. 
when we, out of all the tens of thousands of crucifixions carried out by the Romans, only the crucifixion of Jesus changed the course of human history. Centuries after Jesus was crucified, crucifixion as a form of death was outlawed because of Christian influence. Jesus, by dying on a cross, abolished crucifixion. Eventually, the reconciliation with God obtained for us by Jesus being condemned to death for our sakes will result in the abolition of all evil. Jesus did not save himself from being condemned to die on a cross. He died on the cross to save us. God sent his son, his only begotten son, so that we might have eternal life. When we think about our call to discipleship today, Christ calls uh, us to come to his cross and to know that the way of the cross is the only way that leads home to eternal life with God. There is no other way. There's only one way, and that is the cross. The cross leads us home. I want you today to reflect on your commitment to Christ, and more importantly, fulfilling your commitment to Christ and God's plan in helping redeem other men and women. And so I encourage you today to be faithful to your calling as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I encourage you to be faithful to others and sharing the testimony of Christ and what He's done in your life for you. So I pray, Father Lord, today, May your grace, mercy, kindness, Lord, be upon us. Father, Lord, we thank you so much. Father, Lord, for the, uh, the, the willing heart of Jesus Christ to die on Calvary so that we might have redemption. We might have salvation. We might have eternal life. Give us the strength, Father, Lord, as Christ had. Lord, when we face persecution, when we face accusations, be with us, Lord Jesus, and give us your grace, give us your peace, give us your mercy. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. The Lord bless you. See you next week.